Uh, but we're still talking about COVID-19. Uh, we're talking about stigma. And for the last three or so weeks, we've dedicated uh, some days to talking about stigma and how we can educate more people to understand that COVID-19 is not a death sentence. You can survive from it, whether or not you have some underlying ailments. And, you know, even after, it will be better if you tell your story just to educate people more because there are still people who don't believe that the virus exists. And uh, we've been doing this with our doctor every week, uh, making sure that you find out all the details that you need. And interestingly, we've had people share their re recovery stories. Um, we've had people talk to us about how they've battled the virus and lots of other things as well. And so right now, we have in the studios our doctor. Good morning and you're welcome. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good. Yourself. My first, I'm fine, thank you. My first question will be about doctors, leaders who are unable to speak out for fear of stigmatization because let's face facts in other countries we've seen people come out and tell their stories doctors have documented that people who even documented the process yeah. from when they contracted the virus when they went on a ventilator and all of that and it helped to educate people why is it that on this side of the world we're scared to still talk about it even for leaders that we expect to be the ones spearheading the stigmatization campaign um, first of all, it's quite sad that people who are supposed to actually be leading this um, charge are the ones who are not able to talk about it, to talk about their story, to mm -hmm. share their story out there. And sometimes I'm tempted to believe personally that cultural, uh, cultural practices come in here where we are, we are more shrouded in secrecy, keeping things to yourself, mm. not keeping up this facade of something, not people knowing. But then it's, it's high time we are able to make people tell their story. Yeah. And it, it begins, I always say it begins with us. Mm. First of all, we health workers are, we are the, we see these things and we understand, we have a better understanding than actually the other person who is out there. Yeah. So if we are not able to take the lead and also share these stories out there, it will be difficult for someone who doesn't even understand or who can't even spell coronavirus yeah. to talk about it. Absolutely. But if we have studied, we know about it, we read about it, then we should take the lead to bring it out there, let people know that you can have it, you can recover, it's like any other virus. But that's the problem because, um, again, let me just inform viewers, we actually had a doctor who was supposed to tell you know, her story. Unfortunately, even though she was ready to, her family wasn't sure it was right for her to come on air and speak on it. And so if we're saying that doctors are the ones supposed to spearhead it, and yet the backbone to the doctors are saying no, how do we win this fight? So I believe that um, winning this fight entails all of us coming together and talking about it. TV3 has spearheaded this and they're doing massively because people are hearing about coronavirus or mm. COVID-19 daily. I mean, daily. On a daily basis, We talk yeah. about it. People share their stories. Mm -hmm. So I think the best we can do is to share our story. I think yesterday I chanced upon some medical students, um, KNUST Medical Students Association, mm. also championing this course with a Stop the Stigma campaign. Yeah. So little by little, I, I believe we would get there, mm -hmm. even though it's quite sad what is going on because the effects may not be seen. People may just hear of all this stigma, mm -hmm. but the effects, it's like a cascade. There's a whole lot that goes on behind that people are going through. That's the thing, because how bad can it get with stigmatization? Can you go as far as suicide? Of course, with stigmatization, you can get depressed. Then all these things come up. There are reports of people who actually attempted that suicide because of stigma because we're diagnosed of COVID-19 or How? coronavirus. So the fear of stigma, I believe that in our community or in our setting, mm -hmm. people we are people are used to keeping up appearances, in quotes, mm -hmm. if I may say. So once anything threatens that appearance, they feel it's the end. Yeah. So they try to, I don't know, end it all. So that's why our clinical psychologists always come in to help Make sure people can reconcile or accept mm -hmm. the, first of all, accepting the diagnosis because you go through all these phases, denial, anger, all yeah. everything. So accepting the diagnosis and then being positive about it. What do I have to do to get better? Mm -hmm. Knowing that I would get better. No mm -hmm. matter what you go through, you would get better. But if you sink into depression, that even worsens your situation because you still need your immune system to be strong. Exactly. And depression can contribute to weakening it. Exactly. And when you're depressed, you're not actually in the mood to even do anything at all. Take your mm. medications, you're not in the mood. Talk to people, you're not able to do that. So it's, it's a, another aspect of coronavirus where we also look at, because it's not just about the viral infection, mm -hmm. but also the effects of that infection as well on the human being. Now, talking about the effects of that infection, we've also learned that coronavirus, even after you've recovered from it, 
can lead to amnesia, can lead to a number of other illnesses. How true is this? So the, this is an area of research, an, a green area that is going on post-recovery syndromes. Uh -huh. The thing is, after recovery, some things do happen. There are some people who can even develop some gastritis, some people develop some difficulty in breathing, is there any fibrosis in their lungs? But mm -hmm. this is all not very known because everything is new with coronavirus. Okay. So after the discharge, people are always checked up on. There's a review schedule for everyone. Mm -hmm. Then you try to pick up these things and see how best you can work around it. Now, even yesterday, I just read up of how coronavirus can trigger um, diabetes in a patient. Even when you didn't have diabetes? Exactly. So... How does that Things work? Things are a bit dynamic with coronavirus. It's every day we get new things come up. We read up new things, new research come up. Uh -huh. So coronavirus is, 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 is not an easy virus. Well, break it down for me. When you say it could trigger diabetes, what happens in your body? I know we're still, you know, discovering all the facts, but do you have a fair idea of how this works? So normally for the average person, when you're talking about diabetes, there are two types. Either one, your insulin receptors are not working well. So even though there's insulin, it's not able to work well. Mm -hmm. Or two things. Or the second one being that the body is not producing more insulin. Yeah. Once the body is not producing more insulin, meaning the body has developed some antibodies that is attacking the organ that produces the insulin. Mm -hmm. So basically these are the two major types Aside from the other types of when you maybe are pregnant and then that comes up and everything, which usually goes away mm -hmm. after pregnancy. But this one, they are still doing research into knowing the pathophysiology or how, which pathway this one follows. But these are the two major pathways where diabetes can occur. So what can you do then? I mean, after you've recovered, is there something you can do to protect yourself from developing some of these other ailments? So the thing is, you don't know what will predispose you to that. So mainly follow-ups. We check and see if anything, then we step in and then see how best we can help. Oh, that's scary. But have we come across any patients who have started developing other ailments as a result of COVID-19? So I know of a patient who previously said she did not have diabetes, but her sugars kept rising. Uh. There are people who said they, had not, they didn't have hypertension, but their BPs kept going up. And then you manage it as it comes. We are still doing more research, taking more data, reading up more. So you can't really confirm that only this caused it or was it there before the person got it? That a lot of Ghanaians don't even do um, regular checkups. So they don't know mm. their baseline BP. They don't know their normal sugar level. There's baseline BP as well. Yes, because, um, okay. for example, your BP may usually be 11060. That uh -huh. is your normal that BP. That should be the normal 11060. No, no, no. So normal BP is 12080 okay. or below. Okay. Okay. So someone may naturally have even 130.80. Norm that is the person's resting BP. Oh, so it varies with each It can vary. Individual. And if, for example, even pulse, an athlete will have a slower pulse than a normal person. You check an athlete's pulse, it, should be like, it could be like 40 or even 50 beats per minute. Okay. But the average person will have like 80 beats per minute. Why is that so? Because of the physical activity, the heart has been trained to pump more with few beats. Is that healthier? Yes. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay, so that's why they encourage people to exercise. Exercise often. and okay, everything. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. Carry on. So that's the thing about the human body. There are some variations in norm with everyone. So knowing your balanced state helps to know when there's a tip, either to one side, the bad side, or the negative side. You could tell. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot we're learning as a result of COVID, but people are getting tired now. When you even put out the figures. They're like, not oh, again, not we're again. used to this. <laughs> After today, we're probably going to record another 500 cases. Why should we care? Should we care? Well, we should care because um, previously we were saying that uh, we had like 10,000, our deaths were like 48 or uh -huh. 51. But then, as the numbers keep going, the people who, are, or who won't be able to fight it would also get infected. Because mm. as it's spreading, it will spread to people who have a weakened immune system or who may not be able to fight it. So our criticals will go up. And once our criticals or severe cases are going up, our risk for more deaths also go up as well. Mm -hmm. So as the numbers are increasing, it's, it's also like um, the rate of increasing of that will also mm -hmm. increase our mortalities and increase our critical cases as well. Okay. So we sh it's quite alarming. We have to make sure we, we, we still be wary of coronavirus. But people actually are not putting or following the measures that have been laid down. People don't wear masks. You yeah. go out now and... How did you see anyone wearing masks? No, People now, masks. now they are. I mean, I'm hearing in the Volta region, there's a municipality that has been told to either wear a mask or pay 20 CDs on the spot. 
That's great. And so maybe we should think about making this a national policy. I think so. Yeah, then a lot of people will probably be <laughs> parting ways with about 100 Ghana cities every day of their lives until they learn to wear it. But also now explain to us, when they say someone is in critical condition as a result of coronavirus or COVID-19, what does it mean? Okay, so Not first of all, that. the levels, we can have someone who is asymptomatic, who shows nothing. Mm. We have the mild symptoms, maybe some sore throat, an irritating cough, something If you're simple. sneezing, is that cause for worry? If you're co um, confirmed and you're sneezing? No, no, no. If you have not general, been confirmed, in general, you're sneezing. Oh, no, no, no. You have oh, to find out not. why you're okay, sneezing. Okay, okay, okay. I'm just well, asking you because... Sneezing? No, but they're asking... Uh, they're telling us that you should look out for the signs and symptoms. So I was asking if sneezing is part of it. So the funny thing is with the signs and symptoms, okay, it's that also can vary. Okay. So from some people, so far the people we've, we've read about and what we've seen, people may have a very mild sore throat, cold, a very mild one for a few days, uh -huh. and then it will recover. Then perception of smell yeah. goes down. Uh -huh. Now, once that perception of smell goes down, the probability of you being positive is very high. Okay. Very high. Okay. So once, if you, anyone is watching and you feel that your perception of smell has gone down, please report to a health facility and then be tested. What if it's taste? Taste as well. Without the smell? Usually, it's the smell progressing to taste. Oh, but, that's how it starts? Yes. Oh, but I see. even if you have it, it's best you go and be tested. Okay. Because previously, this was not there. We mm. never talked about loss of smell. Mm -hmm. But as the disease progressed and more information came about, we realized that, okay, this is also part of it. Oh, I see. Okay, so now let's talk about the critical cases. You're telling us what it means to be, um, you know, critical. under critical condition. So critical condition meaning that you are in a very severe condition uh -huh. okay so respiratory compromise or the other so the thing about um coronavirus is there's a part where there's multi multi-organ failure okay so that plays you are critical the respiratory you need respiratory support your kidneys may not be functioning as they are supposed to function mm -hmm. and then there may be other um, maybe the brain as well because you we have the brain who, yes we have people who present young people who have strokes did they have wait Wait, hold on. They have a stroke as a result of COVID-19? Yes. So these people previously had no predisposing or known predisposing condition that would lead them to have a stroke. But then they've realized that especially young people who develop, develop it come up with strokes. Huh? Yeah. Here in Ghana? Well, this is a research that we Oh, had. okay. Okay. <laughs> we haven't experienced this in Ghana yet, have we? I think we are still taking data. We're still collecting data. So currently, it's not been associated here, but it's a fact that we all know. So we always look out for this. If a young person comes with that, you have to make sure you rule that out as well. You can get a stroke from COVID-19. Yes. Do, are you likely to recover? So the thing about strokes is, um, depending on the location of the stroke, the type of the stroke, uh -huh. that would determine the prognosis or the outcome. Okay. So if um, whichever area of the brain is, in, is affected, that shows out maybe one side can't move, Function, can't yeah. talk, uh -huh. something like that. So if it's a side that is um, not so, or the, affair, or the insults there or the injury there is not so much, then you can get away with it. There are people who have bad strokes, but just they are able to recover fully, 100% fully. The others who have some stroke, they have residual neurological, they can't walk, they have to do physiotherapy yeah. and everything. But can you recover from this? Well, I haven't managed such a case yet, okay. but from the readings, what we've read, uh -huh. they are able to recover. They, they may, some ended up with neurological deficits, but then these are elsewhere where they have more facilities and yeah. more systems in place for such cases. But in Ghana, can we manage such a situation if it should come up? Well, if it's a stroke, we've been managing strokes okay. every day. It's one of our top most conditions. It's not any have. different if COVID-19 is causing the stroke. It's stroke still the same stroke. kind. Exactly. I see. Wow, then, then we all have to stay healthy and try and avoid getting infected. Because mm -hmm. at this point, you can't really tell what's going to happen because you're saying that it usually affects young people. Yes. And I told someone that, how do you know your immune system is quite strong and able to beat it? It's until you get it. So don't get it. Because the fact yeah. that you're okay working normally and everything doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean that everything is okay. What if there. I'm eating my food, so I'm exercising regularly? That is a, an indication that my immune system is good, no? But what's your baseline BP? You, sh you need to know your baseline. Can we so, all measure our baseline BP by ourselves? Oh, when you're home, just the machine, check your BP, that's all. Okay. So you know your BP. So if your BP is... There are people who... Um, so the thing about hypertension is, even if you have it, there may not be any symptoms or signs to show that you have it. So people don't go to the hospital. People go to the hospital because they are sick. They don't go to the hospital just for regular checkups. Mm. The average person doesn't do that. Yeah. So if you're someone who... Do, you don't, you've not been to the hospital like two, three years, mm. you don't know where you are now, even though you may be eating fruits and vegetables, but then... 
something may be going on in your system as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, on that note, Dr. Emanuel Amankra has been speaking to us about COVID-19. We started with stigmatization. Now I'm finding out that even young people could develop stroke as a result of COVID-19. And, uh, well, it just indicates that we all have to be alert because COVID-19 is no respecter of persons. Thank you so much, Dr. Emanuel Amankra. He is the lead at the Lekma Isolation Center. And uh, I'm sure that hopefully next week we'll get even more information about people who may have recovered or might be battling with it and are hopeful that they will recover. But stay safe. It's important. We'll